Well, welcome everybody. I have the honor and pr privilege of welcoming you this evening um, for our monthly author's presentation. We were thrilled to find Catherine Van Arsdell and the fact that she did a book specifically on the Angwin and Howe Mountain area. And I've not read this book. I'm looking forward to it. I know we have the book um, on order and we're also offering the book for sale through the Historical Society and our gift shop. Um, a little bit about Catherine. Um, Catherine is an archivist and special collections librarian at Pacific Union College in Angwin. Um, before coming to Napa County in 2015, Catherine worked for several years as a research librarian in Washington, DC. Uh, using her master's in history and MLIS in library science from the Catholic University of America, Catherine especially enjoys researching local history and bringing it to life. Um, just so you know, Catherine does have her own website. It's Catherine Van Arnstel. Is it .com, Catherine? I believe it's That's .com. Right. Yeah. And when you open up the site, you'll see it says, I'm a librarian and archivist who is interested in digital humanities, undergraduate scholarships, and the history of place. And I, I love that. And you have many talents there that, um, including being a curator. So we may have to talk about that in maybe future exhibits, we can work together. So everybody, please welcome Catherine Van Arsdell. Thank you. Well, I'm so happy to be with you all tonight. And I'm really excited to talk about the history of the place that I'm so lucky to get to live. Um, let me share my screen with you so I can show you pictures while I talk. One second. All right. So the photographs that I've chosen to share with you tonight, many of them come from the uh, the actual, pres uh, actual book and some are pictures that I wish I could have included, but I didn't get a chance to. So I look at this as an opportunity to kind of branch out beyond what I was able to include on the pages and talk about the full story of this book that I was able to work on and the history of a place uh, that we all know a little bit because it's part of Napa County, but it's a small part and it's a little bit further north and a little bit higher in the air. So um, I've, I put up a little bit on the screen about the sources that I used as I was doing my research. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about why I wrote this particular book. And a, a lot of the resources that I came across, I came across them just in the course of doing my job. I work at Pacific Union College as an archivist and a special collections librarian, as Liz so kindly said. And I just get to work with all of the most um, rare and interesting materials, I think. So at Pacific Union College, this college is a very small liberal arts college up on a mountaintop overlooking Napa Valley. It's been here since 1909, but it's in a place that has existed much longer than the college has been here. And just by being here for so long, this college has collected material from people who lived in the area, people who came to this school, and people who just knew, okay, if I have a bunch of photographs, or if I have some books, or if I have memories, who can I share these with? It's an institution that lasts over time. And so it has collected a lot of these stories from this, this tiny little community that is a little bit remote and a little bit unique. And so I'm very lucky because I get to work with and organize and make available all of this material. When I came here in 2015, I didn't know any of the history of California, really, uh, other than what you learn in school just by being a, a young person in the United States. I didn't know anything about Angwin. I didn't know anything about Napa County other than the fact that it's world famous for incredible wine. And so I had to kind of start from scratch. So I was lucky because I was surrounded by all of the stuff you can start with. I had books of local history. I had access to digitized newspapers from Napa Valley, uh, all of these different newspapers that have been digitized and are available so that you can search them. I had all of the uh, material at Pacific Union College that was either related to the college itself or related to its community. And just by being surrounded by this material, by working with it, I started to learn some of these little stories, little bits and pieces 
about the history of Angwin and kind of spreading out from there, the history of the mountain where Angwin, this little tiny town is located. Because when you're part of such a small community, you're, you can't possibly be disconnected from the communities that surround you. And if you're familiar at all with Howell Mountain or with Napa County in general, it's the story of little communities that are all interconnected. And this is no, no different here on Howell Mountain. So that is what I kind of learned just by doing research and doing work in my day to day life. I also was interacting with a lot of alumni of the college with people from the Angwin community and with people who just live nearby who would ask me questions and say, well, what do you know about such and such? And through answering these interesting questions, I learned more interesting facts. And I have to give all the credit for this book to the people who have talked to me over the years about what they know about Anglin, what they know about Howell Mountain, and particularly what they have known about Pacific Union College. Because there have been multiple people who said, I know you have photographs, I know there are stories. Why is there not a book about Angwin and Howell Mountain yet? I'll go back really quickly. Uh, so specifically, people were telling me, why don't we have an Images of America book? So this was really an idea that others gave to me by saying, I know we should have this. Someone needs to do it. Why not you? And I could not tell them why not. So uh, that is why I started to think about it years ago. And slowly but surely over time, I started to just kind of draft the book in my head. So here's the cover. I want to start with this cover photograph. So the cover photograph that we chose for this book is a picture of a place on Howell Mountain that's called Overhanging Rock. Uh, some of you may have heard of it, you may be familiar with it, you're certainly familiar with the idea of sort of like hidden jewels across Napa Valley. And this is one of those hidden jewels that in a way is sort of, um, it's, it's almost forgotten today, it still exists. But it's part of this rich history of Howell Mountain that I discovered, which is so fascinating to me, that people of the past, no surprise, used to walk everywhere. And this was one of their destinations. And so it's it's this beautiful location that's kind of on the uh, on the southern side of Howell Mountain overlooking uh, where you would see Lake Hennessy today in this photograph, what I think you see behind them. I think I think that might be Napa Valley. I'm not sure because I've never been to Overhanging Rock. So I don't have any personal sort of reference point for this geographical place, but I know that it's a place that a lot of people used to walk to, not just people from Angwin, not just people from Deer Park, not just people from St. Helena, but people before even the, uh, before Americans were here, before Mexican, settlers were here before the Spanish. This is a destination that people were drawn to. It's one of many on the mountain. And so it is a really wonderful sort of representative photograph to show you to say, this is the sort of place that Howell Mountain is. It's very rustic. It's very, um, it's very separate and it's high. It's high up overlooking some beautiful land and some beautiful parts of the country. So that is why we chose this photograph. And the reason why I've never been there, I forgot to say this, it's because it's part of private property now. Uh, if I knew who the property owners were, perhaps I could ask and go for a walk, but I don't know. So it's part of also this history of Napa County and a history of, in fact, the United States and the world before we all started to uh, have the sort of understanding of culture that we have today. It's this story of pioneers, people working together, people being in this very close knit community where, in fact, there were very few fences. So that's sort of the story of Howell Mountain that I began to discover. And I got deeper into the details and I'd like to share some of them with you tonight. So I had mentioned a little bit about the sources that I looked at. I will mention also this photograph, which does appear in the book. It's a photograph of some folks who were uh, visiting a, a resort on Howell Mountain. And in fact, it was Angwin's resort. And we will get a little bit more into that later. So some of those happy resort goers of California history. There are so many wonderful resorts that were in this area. We will talk about a few tonight. 
So in order to tell this story, I certainly wanted to start before before the land was colonized. I wanted to start with the earliest information and the earliest history that I could find. So I started with the indigenous people who I had been able to research who had lived here. And I didn't even have to research to know that indigenous people had lived on Howell Mountain because the marks that they left behind are visible like from my office, from, from Angwin. You can stand next to the town sign and you can see places where there are acorn grinding holes in the rock. So this is not, this is not something that you can avoid or forget, really. It's present in front of you. If you are in Angwin, if you come to Howell Mountain, you're confronted by this history. So I wanted to try and dive in. What can we know and what can we try to recover? And what do we see when we walk on the land that is Howell Mountain today? So that's where we start our story. So to the best of my knowledge, um, Howell Mountain kind of lands in this really interesting place, sort of a juncture of what we understand today to be these uh, divisions between indigenous people groups. We have Miwok people to the north, we have the Wapo people who were very prevalent in Napa Valley, and then the Patwin who would be further to the east, definitely living near Lake Berryessa today. And I have a map here that I've shown you that someone else made that we just do the best we can to interpret where, where these lines may have been drawn. And I put a very rough estimate of where Howell Mountain might fall. This is not me, I'm not a cartographer, but if you were to look at that little green uh, symbol there, that's sort of where Howell Mountain would be, close. Certainly you should do more research to determine the exact location. But what we know is that Howell Mountain is this interesting place where there was a pathway for the people, the Wapo people to pass from their uh, settlements in Napa Valley across Howell Mountain. It's one of the major thoroughfares for them to reach Pope Valley, which is also part of Napa County. And so uh, it, for them, this was a major transition to pass over the mountain. And the footpath that they left behind eventually became, of course, the sort of the foundation of a road that later ran through the town of Angwin. It's this long history of people passing through. And these people, we believe, stayed. So some of the things that I was able to learn there was certainly an indigenous village site in the area where Angwin is today. There was an archaeologist, uh, his name was Robert Stearns, who came in October of 1881 and did some uh, digging and did some research here in the valley where Angwin is located on the peak of Howell Mountain. And he was able to find uh, obsidian spear points and acorn grinding stones and mortars and pestles left behind by the indigenous people. It is Perhaps it is likely that it was the WAPO because of the sort of sites that they left behind. Um, let me, sh I've shown you a picture of a, a sort of an artistic rendering of what a village might have looked like. Um, the WAPO would often build their villages near a water source, and there's a creek that runs through Anglin. Near that creek, there, there is where Robert Stearns found many of the artifacts that he found. And up on a hill overlooking the creek, this is where uh, he found sites where there were perhaps village, village sites, and those sites remained until the 1930s. There were young people in Angwin who would go play in these locations that there were depressions in the earth, and the only memory they had was that it was part of what they called the Indian land. So here are some of those sorts of things. These are not the, not the objects that Robert Stearns found. But what we do know is the people, um, perhaps the Wapo, lived here for so long and were so comfortable on Howell Mountain that they left many artifacts behind. So we talk a bit about that in the book. And these are some photographs of artifacts actually found in Angwin or in its outskirts near nearby on Howell Mountain. Uh, this sort of thing, it turns up every time it rains. Every time somebody goes for a walk in the forest, there's a very good chance you might find an obsidian arrowhead. You might find uh, a, a, a mortar and pestle if you go to plow your land to build a, a garden. So this is, this is clearly a place where there were people 
long before the Spanish came, before the Mexicans, there were people living here and we still see the evidence of their lives behind, uh, that they left behind. So I had mentioned that there was a particular site. Um, so there, the, the way that you can kind of determine um, uh, what sorts of sites existed in Angwin or Howell Mountain, it's, uh, it's very much um, kind of like a, a, a scattershot history. Uh, there are archaeologists like Robert Stearns who came in the 1880s. There are records of archaeological digs. We know that there were um, sites found in Las Posadas Forest around 1900, but the sorts of records that we have are sort of, um, uh, they're, they're incomplete. And it's often if the records were made long ago, then they won't really be up to the standards of how much we wish we knew today. So many of the stories that I kind of build uh, this, this story as we try to tell it in the book, to be honest and to be as authentic as possible about the history of indigenous people on Howell Mountain. Um, we know that they were drawn here for many of the same reasons that we were, be, uh, because of the land, because it's beautiful, because it's a wonderful place to live. But what can we know about them? Many of the stories that I have are simply coming from uh, people's memories. So I'll tell you about two memories right now. The first is uh, from actually one of the earliest pioneers of Howell Mountain, and that would be Elvira Engwin. She told a story to Robert Stearns while he was staying at her ranch, while he was doing his archaeological work in 1881. She had lived there since 1874, and he asked her just to tell him a little bit about her life there. She knew he was researching prehistory, and she told him that a few years before, while she was standing on the front porch of her house, uh, an indigenous man came walking from perhaps the direction of Cayoca Pass today. And he approached her house, came up to her and said, I would like to see this place. This is where I grew up. And she said, well, you're welcome to stay. And the two of them stood together for a moment and just looked around at the location where they were, this place at the top of Howell Mountain. And then she told Robert Stearns that he went up and over the hills and she never saw him again, perhaps headed to Pope Valley. So that's one memory that we have that brings kind of that, that personal touch. Another memory that I, I heard just a few years ago, so it's so recent you can almost touch it. If it feels like the Wapo people or the indigenous people are so far away that we can't touch them, we're only a generation or two connected to them, more or less. So there's a young, there was a young man who was growing up in Angwin in the 1930s. He's still alive today. He remembers playing at a site on what is now Sky Oaks Drive today that based on his descriptions and based on the information that you can find in ethnographic studies and in histories, sounds like it might have been a ceremonial site. It might have been a sweat lodge. It might have been someplace like that. And so uh, he, he would remember playing in this depression in the earth surrounded by a ring of rocks. He and the other uh, children would play in this place and it was destroyed eventually when uh, the, there was a big building boom after World War II. So thinking back on the past, knowing how closely connected we are to our, our, uh, our neighbors who lived here, the indigenous people, but also recognizing that we have made some decisions um, collectively and culturally that we should try to remember. So capturing those memories in the book, and so I've included this picture of the Pomo people from Lakeport, just a little ways north near uh, Clear Lake. And uh, they're, they're neighbors of the Wapo, neighbors of the Patwin, but sort of capturing that idea of what might life have been like in this small settlement that was actually at the top of Howell Mountain. Perhaps there were ceremonial, uh, ceremonial dances, perhaps there were um, marriages and births People lived here and we don't know their story, but we try to remember what little we have. So that's the way I wanted to start the book. And that's the way I wanted to start tonight. Thinking about what little we can remember about this place before this sort of uh, 
this, this sort of current story, the one that we're in right now before that story begins. So we do know that in 1823, that is when Jose Altamira came and entered Napa Valley for the first time, the Spanish explorer. And that signaled a giant change for this area. And it signaled a change for Howell Mountain too. Obviously we're far before the town of Angwin, we're before Deer Park, we're before all of these hotels and resorts and beautiful places that we know today, natural places existed, but they weren't called by the names we know them now. So this is when an era begins to change. So the first thing that's like really, really makes an impact on Howell Mountain it comes from one of those first settlers of Napa Valley, and that would be George Yaunt, founder of Yauntville, a uh, man who received uh, uh, the first uh, Mexican land grant that he got um, was not based on Howell Mountain, but he was already established in Napa Valley. He had started out as a carpenter for, uh, uh, for General Vallejo, and he had settled in this place. And he recognized at some point, and I don't know how, I don't know why, but he recognized the value of Howell Mountain and the value of these mixed forests and the fresh air and this, this high place that overlooked Napa Valley. Uh, far from where he lived, as if you had to walk, for us today, it's a short drive, but for him, from where he uh, eventually established Yauntville to Howell Mountain, it's a bit of a trek. But for some reason, he chose Howell Mountain because he knew that this was going to be good for him and he wanted to, uh, to have a sawmill and to make use of these forests. And so when he received his second land grant from the Mexican government in 1843, he specifically requested the land that encompassed Howell Mountain and that was called Rancho La Joda. So this is the first person to own this land after the indigenous people who had owned it for so long. George Yant hired two people to help uh, watch over his land grant. And those people were Isaac and John Howell. And Isaac Howell was, uh, was this patriarch of the Howell family. He and his family had traveled to California the same year that the Donner Party did. They actually met together in Fort Bridger in Wyoming, traveled together through Hastings Cutoff, and because Isaac Howell had adult sons with him, including his son John, they were able to travel faster than the Donners and some of the others who were with them. They actually passed through Donner Pass before the snows came. And they arrived in Napa Valley, and that is when they began to work for George Yaunt. And they actually settled on the lower slopes of Howell Mountain at first, near Crystal Springs, where the St. Helena Hospital is today. Um, Isaac Howell had a, had a cottage there. It's said that John Howell shot a grizzly. They were supposed to civilize this Mexican land grant, keep an eye on George Yaunt's land. The picture that you're looking at right now is a cottage that was presumably built by John Howell in the 1860s. This is at least what local legend says. He, according to legend, sold it to Edwin and Elvira Angwin, who later sold it to Pacific Union College. This was a building that was a part of what is today Angwin. It no longer stands. But in a way, this is a connection, if you were to stand in Angwin today, a connection to that pioneer era, a connection to, in fact, the Donner Party, a very, uh, a very sort of strange connection and coincidence, if you think about it that way. But it is possible that John and Isaac Howell and their family are the reason why Howell Mountain is called Howell Mountain today. Again, many things are based on local legend. This is what I was able to find in things that I read. This is how people remember it, at the very least. All right. So back on that spot where John Howell shot the grizzly bear, down a little further on Howell Mountain, about three miles from St. Helena, just as the mountain begins to rise to the east, there was a location, again, as I said, Crystal Springs, a place with clear, clean water. 
a place where William Pratt had purchased uh, a, a about I think it was about ten acres of land. I'd have to look again, but he purchased a set. He purchased some acres of land on sort of a shelf overlooking this little dip and valley where Glass Mountain Road runs today, which we're all familiar with with the with the history of what happened last year. William Pratt purchased this piece of land, and he got to know this young man named Merrick Kellogg, a young doctor of hydrotherapy and a Seventh-day Adventist who believed in the merits of clean air, clean water, vegetarian food, and a brisk lifestyle. Merrick Kellogg was a stepbrother, or I'm sorry, a half-brother, a half-brother of John Harvey Kellogg, who had established the Battle Creek Sanitarium, and a half-brother of W.K. Kellogg, who was the man whose name is on all those boxes of cornflakes. So in the same spirit that his Kellogg family was establishing a sanitarium in Battle Creek, Michigan, Merritt Kellogg followed that path and he created what he called the Rural Health Retreat by partnering with William Pratt in this location on the slopes of Howell Mountain in 1878. They created this hospital, which was a hospital for the well and for the sick. And they made it a place that you could come if you wanted to become better, become healthier, learn how to do that, and also to recover from any illness that you might have. Uh, the treatments involved a lot of outside time, a lot of that fresh air, a lot of that mountain lifestyle. And this was what drew them. And it's what drew patients to the St. Helena Hospital before it was called by that name started out as the Rural Health Retreat, became the St. Helena Sanitarium until 1869, and is now the St. Helena Hospital. But the same principles, they applied them all along. Even today, you can go to that hospital and have a vegetarian meal from the cafeteria. And that's part of the principles of health that this hospital was attempting to establish in 1878, when medicine was still very different in the United States. The hospital also made a name for itself by establishing uh, a nursing school in 1891. So they saw that there was a need to train more people to be nurses, to, to follow these health principles that they found so helpful, both for preventing and treating diseases. In 1891, when they established this hospital at the St. Helena, or established this a nursing school at St. Helena Hospital. It was one of the first 400 hospital-based nursing schools in the United States. So in a way, a bit of a groundbreaker. It was also the place that, again, according to the self-reportage, the first male nursing graduate of a nursing school in California, he came out in the class of 1892. His name was Olaf Olson. So it is possible that we can claim the fame of seeing the first male nursing school graduate here in Napa County, right on Howell Mountain. So I've shown you a picture of a few of the nursing students. Uh, they would often work at the hospital as well. And that's why you see this picture that I'm sure is very familiar and very natural to look at with these young ladies wearing masks during the influenza epidemic of 1918. This hospital, because it existed from 1878, it was present for a lot of those really incredible moments in American history, um, particularly history in this area. Not only did they treat the people in this area who may have fallen sick of the Spanish flu, but they were also the place where uh, refugees from the earthquake of 1906 escaped from San Francisco and had to come to the North Bay and, and scattered all over to find places that were safe, that were still standing. And this was one of the closest hospitals. There were so many people who came for treatment that they set up uh, tents outside of the building so that they could have more housing. So this is one of the things that they were able to do. Well, one of, the, one of the appeals of the rural health retreat, the sanitarium, the hospital, one of the appeals was its location and its 
its ability to make the well person even better. And this was actually something that kind of carried through in the way that people treated their early years on Howell Mountain, the way that early settlers looked at the land that they owned and what they could do with it on Howell Mountain. So that's why I call uh, this era that we kind of look at the end of the 1800s, I'm going to call it the resort era. There were certainly people here that were growing grapes. Charles Krug owned land and he was growing grapes for viticulture. And there were people who were farming just to, to make a uh, good, good money and to support their family, like uh, the Morris Ranch and they were located in Las Posadas Forest. But there were also a number of those Cal early California resorts that were established on Howell Mountain. And from one of them, Angwin gets its name. So we'll start there. Edwin Angwin was an immigrant from Cornwall. He and his two brothers came from Cornwall long before he ever came to California. He worked his way to the West, worked for a railroad for a time, which is no surprise when you know California history, pretty good money there. But in 1874, he was married to Elvira Mendenhall and he wanted to settle down. So the two of them purchased 200 acres of what he called the best part of Rancho La Hoda from one of the descendants of George Yaunt. These 200 acres encompassed this sort of valley at the top of Howell Mountain, which is the place where Robert Stearns came and stayed at their ranch so that he could do his archeological work to determine the history of the indigenous people of this, of this mountain. So they had purchased not only the most beautiful land that they loved, not only was it wonderful for agriculture because of this concrete running through the middle of the valley and this really rich soil, but it was also a historic spot they never could have known. They picked it because it was good for a ranch. And that is all that the Anguins intended to do with their 200 acres. But uh, shortly after they had settled, a friend came to stay with them. And the friend suggested to Edwin Anguin, this is a nice place. And the air is good. And the water is good. In fact, he had a number of springs on his property, which have never run dry in all of his recorded memory and even today. So this was a really great spot. Why don't you make some money, he said, and why don't you help some people while you do it? And so a friend suggested to the Anguins that they establish a resort. They didn't have a hotel building at first. Edwin and Elvira Anguin started with a series of cottages and tents. And then eventually in the 1880s, they built a hotel with, uh, with a dining room that could seat 150 and enough rooms for everyone to stay. They still had tents and cottages for those who wished for the more rustic experience. And in fact, uh, author Ambrose Bierce, who wrote uh, the short story, An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge, which many of us read in school, he would often come and stay and he had a favorite cottage. And there is actually a picture of him in his favorite cottage that UCLA owns. So if you'd like to see it there, you can find it on Calisphere or on the online archive of California. What we have pictures of are the hotel and the cottages without Ambrose Bierce in them. But we do know that he stayed here and we have uh, some quotes that he gave about Angwin that really capture this beautiful, beautiful environment and just how uh, rustic it was. Of course, the Angwins weren't the only ones. I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you about a few of the other resorts. I will just show you a couple right now. There were many. One of them that's very important to remember because parts of it still exist, okay? The, uh, I will admit, Edwin Angwin's resort, the only part of it that remains is the uh, stone wall that once stood around it. But if you'd like to find evidence of the old resorts of Howell Mountain, there are parts of Toland House that still stand. If you drive up Howell Mountain, as you approach what we call Four Corners, which is where White Cottage Road, Old Howell Mountain Road, and Deer Park all meet one another. This is a location where just as you go past, as you start to head to Angwin, you will see a house right on your right hand side overlooking Lake Hennessy today. And this is where the Tolans established a resort hotel, or I should say a resort because they mostly did a very rustic version of a resort. 
And people were drawn to these sorts of places simply so that they could walk in the forest, bathe in the creek, hike out to Linda Falls and eat, eat, eat. One of the places that they liked to eat was the White Cottages Resort, which I mentioned White Cottage Road. It's named for that resort even today. White Cottages was a place where uh, three immigrants from Germany, uh, two of them married and one of them a friend, had established this resort. It's just down the street from where Howell Mountain Elementary School is today, right on the, on the road that we now call White Cottage. And they had a number of white cottages that they had established. They invited people to come out to these cottages. Um, they even provided information about how to arrive using a variety of ferries and uh, streetcars and uh, a bit of a buggy ride up the hill. And once you arrived, you could have good German cooking and you could go for a ride in an automobile. These were the draws. One of the people who helped establish White Cottages, his last name was Henne. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly, H-E-N-N-E, -N -N -E. but he was one of those immigrants from Germany who actually came to the United States long before he established White Cottages. And from him, we have a bit of a connection, this local history, the people who lived here. He's a connection back to the Civil War when he was a drummer boy. And he's a connection to the town of San Francisco because he worked to help lay some of the earliest uh, track for the cable cars before he came and established his resort. This is where he retired. What a beautiful place to retire. So what happens when the uh, resort owners decide they're no longer interested in running a, a resort? Well, one of the answers to that question came when Edwin and Elvira Angwin um, decided to retire. And this was in the summer of 1909, right as they approached the end of that summer season. Edwin Angwin was about 70 years old. His wife was a little younger, but they were both uh, parents of four children and they had been running a resort since the 1870s. They were done. They were done running a resort. They still loved Howell Mountain, but they were ready to move on. And so, in 1909, they put their resort hotel and everything in it up for sale. And this is when the town of Angwin became more than a resort, it became a town, and it earned sort of the character that it has even today. So I brought you to a picture of what it became just a few years later. So in 1909, when Edwin and Elvira Angwin sold their resort, they sold it to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And the reason why the Adventist Church was interested in this piece of land is because they already had some roots in the area because of the hospital that Merritt Kellogg had helped establish in, in what is now today Deer Park. He was a Seventh-day Adventist. This was a Seventh-day Adventist hospital. Um, one of the co-founders of the church was living down near Glass Mountain in a, in a house called Elmshaven, which is now today a historic site. And so there were, there were people here that they knew who heard that this resort was for sale and the timing was fortuitous because Pacific Union College was looking for a place to move. Pacific Union College had been located in Healdsburg since 1882, but it was located right in the center of town, just a couple blocks from the main square. And the main purpose of this school was to provide a very interdisciplinary form of education, which was quite unusual in that era. And they wanted their students to be able to experience fresh air and hard work physical labor, in fact, and to be involved with the land. And they couldn't do that from the center of town. So they purchased Angwin's resort and with it, they received everything he had. They purchased a resort wholesale, including even the piano in the, in the parlor of the hotel. They began to build more buildings to truly turn a summer resort into a year round school. And so the picture that you see right now shows Edwin Angwin's farm as cultivated by these college students that they would do this work as part of their of their schooling and part of their schooling they would also uh, actually go out into the Pacific Union College forest and fell redwood trees and mill them at the college mill and build more buildings for for classes and for dormitories, which is what you see in this picture. The town of Angwin clearly grew. 
So I wanted to show you those two pictures back to back because Angwin started out as just a resort. Then it became a college, a location where students came to school, but that sort of drew other industry to the town. Um, the, simply having all of these college students uh, on the top of a mountain with very difficult roads that were not paved until the 1930s, it made it so that you really needed to have everything you could possibly desire to live. You needed to have it at the top of the mountain because to get to St. Helena was in fact kind of treacherous. And to get to uh, the St. Helena Hospital, most people would simply walk. So to uh, to uh, support this college and to support the people who worked there and those who lived at the, on the top of the mountain, whether they were doing agriculture or working in education, which was most of what people did on Howell Mountain. They uh, needed to establish their own store, their own ice cream parlor, their own barber shop and post office. Uh, Edwin Angwin had run the first telephone lines back when he was running the resort, but somebody had to keep all of this up. And so Pacific Union College and the town of Angwin working together became this very self-sufficient uh, industrious town at the top of a mountain with its own power plant today and its own uh, uh, its own recycling center and all of these things that you need just to survive, they were all established at the top of the mountain because that's where everyone lived and it was so hard to get down back in the past. And so looking at those two pictures back to back shows you some of that growth. More, most of that growth really came about after World War II. So it's no surprise to hear that a college town in Napa County would have seen an enormous boom after World War II. The GI Bill brought many veterans and their wives and children to Pacific Union College and to Angwin. And many of them stayed and became residents and lived in this area and made their lives here. So there's actually a really wonderful story. Of, we've included this picture of Veteran Heights, a neighborhood that was created out of Quonset huts to take care of this population boom. Um, but uh, one of the things that's such a, such a success story about Veteran Heights is that this is a community that was established at the very top of Howell Mountain overlooking the town of Angwin back in the 1940s. And at some point in the late 20th century, the name got changed to Mobile Manor to, re to kind of reflect the fact that many people had replaced their Quonset huts with mobile homes. But just recently, after doing many uh, hours of research in the archives, the town of Angwin has returned the name to Veteran Heights. And in fact, if you look on Google Maps, we're back to that historic name, back to those roots, back to this story about why is there a neighborhood here? What, what is the story here and who lived here first? There are other neighborhoods in Angwin that were established around the same time, such as the, the neighborhood on Sky Oaks um, and Hillcrest and Liparita. There are different roads in Angwin that all the homes were built in this giant boom of population after World War II. With this boom of population, whether it was people coming for the, for the hospital to live and work uh, near their job at the hospital, or whether they were coming to be near the college, or whether they were coming for this resurgence of uh, viticulture on the mountain, which was growing and growing and was eventually going to reach a point where it became so world famous that uh, Howell Mountain became the first sub-appellation within the Napa Valley Appalachian for wine became world famous for Cabernet. So people were coming in that second half of the 20th century for all these reasons. And one of the things that happened was uh, the town began to, to spread out. And so one of the pictures I'm showing you now is the Chevron gas station, the first, uh, the first, uh, the first, I would say named commercial building in Angwin was the Chevron. Before everything was locally owned and locally run, first we had the Chevron, then the Bank of America came, then the Bank of America left, and now we have the Silverado Credit Union, which is also locally owned. So there's something about the top of Howell Mountain. But the Chevron station still stands, and so it's nice if you've ever driven through Angwin to see this picture of what it used to look like in 1952 when it was new, and it was all painted, I wish we could see the colors, in green and gold. 
And you can also see a picture of Angwin in the snow. It doesn't snow like it used to do anymore. But of course, the, the elevation of Howell Mountain being at uh, just shy of 1700 feet used to see a lot of snow and we still do see some showers. So another one of those side-by-side -side pictures that's always really neat to see. Um, in 1976, the college market moved from the center of campus uh, and moved out to where the new county road had been running for like uh, since the 19, late 1940s, I believe 1949, was when the road moved from that original footpath once established by the WAPO and was moved to, um, to this place where it is today, where it runs through what was once Edwin Angwin's farmland. And in 1976, the market moved as well to that place where everyone could reach it. It's a fully vegetarian market, a very unusual thing to have at the top of a mountain. And here you can see what it looked like in 1976, side by side with 2016. And in fact, if you look at the book, there's an even newer sign that's gone up and it's been rebranded as the Howell Mountain Market in Delhi. So you can see how things have changed. Oh, I will mention um, right behind the, the first picture in 1976, you can see this beautiful flat topped hill, that's Sentinel Hill, and that's where Cade Estate Winery is today. A, a beautiful, a beautiful little hill that overlooks Angwin as well. And so the last picture I have to share with you today. Um, so been talking to a lot about that commercial center of Angwin, but that's really not the character of Angwin or the character of Howell Mountain. So talking about all these people who've lived here over time, starting with the indigenous people, knowing the history of George Yant and why he wanted to be here. Why was Edwin Angwin here? Why did the Tolans come? Why was White Cottages established? All of it is about the natural beauty of Howell Mountain, which is just an extension of Napa Valley, just a little higher, a little wilder, perhaps a little colder at night. It's a place where forests exist, unbroken stretches of wilderness. And some of those stretches of wilderness are established and run by the Land Trust of Napa County. And Pacific Union College has also entered into some of those uh, collaborations as well. And they have recently entered a collaboration with CAL FIRE to create a conservation easement so that the forests on the east side of Howell Mountain, which are owned by Pacific Union College, will remain an unbroken wilderness, managed to stop the spread of fire, but remaining as a place, a corridor for natural wildlife, a place where people, anyone, anyone at all can come and hike the trails and see some of those spots like overhanging rock. There is a place in the PUC forest called Inspiration Point. You can find that today. Perhaps you can't hike to Devil's Punch Bowl. Perhaps you can't hike to, to overhanging rock, but there are places that humans and animals can still come together and experience this wilderness and this beauty that is Howell Mountain. And that is an extension of Napa Valley. And it's a very unique sort of jewel that we are so proud and so happy to have. And I think one of the benefits of writing this book is letting more people know that this resource is here for you. And this history is in this place. So I'm so glad I got to talk to you today about this place and about this history. I would be so happy to answer questions if you have any. Catherine, your energy and your descriptions of that time and the storytelling, it's, um, I really felt all of it. And, and thank you. You know, I'm sure um, everybody who's attending, I think there's Mayor Sedgley, high five. Oh, and maybe a question too. Um, <clears throat> fascinating. And I'm really glad you went back to the first people, the indigenous, you know, and, um, and I really want to, I want, now I want to find um, overhanging rock. So maybe uh, I know that we have uh, County Supervisor Diane Dillon on um, here tonight. We have Mayor Scott Sedgley. We have, uh, um, I say council member, Board of Supervisors, sorry, Diane. Um, Board of Supervisor, um, Diane Dillon, Board of Supervisor, Brad, Brad Wadconnect. Um, we've got a couple of historians, including Don. Um, who's really knows a lot about the, about the resort. So it's gonna be fun to hear the questions and maybe the feedback in terms of like added information. Um, I can't wait to read your book. 
And I'm going to take notes because I'll learn from you all as well. Well, you know, I, I think it's the power of sharing stories. Yeah. And I love the two stories that you shared in the beginning. I mean, it's just, I can really just feel it. So thank you so much. I was taking notes as you were talking. I was like, oh, these are just great. You know, from the acorn grinding stones, the, the arrowheads, um, the the mortar and pestles. Uh, well, I guess it was obsidian spear points because. We've talked about that in the Historical Society. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know. Let me see if we have any questions. I have some questions, but I'm going to see if we have. Let's have, let's hear from um, um, Scott Sedgley, Mary Sedgley. What's your question, Scott? Thank you, Liz. And, and Catherine, thank, thank you so much for sharing. This has just been a marvelous evening. Uh, and, and, you know, I grew up in Napa and, and Angwin on the rare occasion that I went up there as a child. It was just like it was a different world up there. It was almost like a, a Tahoe experience when you went up there, I guess, because of the, the forest and the experimental forest and everything we did as, as youth and as families. It's an amazing place. Uh, I've, I've seen old maps that sometimes refer to the, the eastern hills, the ridge, like on the west side, we have the Mykamas, but I've mm -hmm. seen the, the whole Eastern Ridge all the way to Mount George, that's just east of Napa, referred to the, yeah. as the Owl Mountains. Yeah. Is, is that, do you agree with that? Oh, that is such a good question. I'm glad you asked. I actually bothered the U.S. Geological Survey to figure out if they knew uh, the answer to this. Um, and I got one of our uh, biology professors and our GIS expert in mapping and our forest, uh, he's also our forest manager. All three of us work together on this. There is no official name, uh, according to the, the US um, uh, geographic names, there's no official name between where the Vacas end and the next set of mountains, which I can't remember the name, where they begin. So it's actually kind of this, this wonderful opportunity where if someone wanted to make a name recommendation, there's this entire process you can go through to establish, okay, here's maybe a historical reason why you should make an official geographic name for this set of mountains, because they do remain unofficially named. And according to the research that I was able to do and that my colleagues helped me do, we did a lot of digging. It seems that there's a lot of colloquial usage of the name, the Howells or the Howell Mountains. And so we have a lot of good background for calling them that, but right now it's sort of a nickname. Well, let's work on that. We, yes. will, we will officially call them. Thank you for that. And, and one more, I have, I have a lifelong friend who was a great, great grandson of Lewis and Caroline Wall, W-A-H-L. And, and they are from the, the, the Wild Lake, White Cottage area, Germans that were settled there at the turn of the yeah. century. And so he's always asking uh, help uh, on, on research for his family. Uh, and he had an, a, a great aunt, Cassie Wall, Catherine or Cassie Wall. So. Uh, I, I will purchase several copies of your book and I'll send a couple to him because he, he's interested and he still owns property out uh, by the Dunn Wild Lake uh, Land Trust Preserve out there. They, their oh, family yeah. still has property out there from the, the old wall uh, uh, homestead. Neat. So that not the wall from the west side of the valley, like Wall Road up right. uh, Oakville Grave, W-A-H-L on that side. So yeah. if you come across any wall history, yeah. W-H-L, love to, love to learn about that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. Nice to meet you. And I see Don, you have your hand up, Don? Yes, I do. That wasn't unintentional. Katie, I got your book the day it was available and devoured it. And it's absolutely wonderful. So exciting and informative. I want to know as to your availability for the NCHS sponsored uh, presentation you're going to give at Lincoln Theater, which will sell out at 1,200 seats, yes. not that far from our headquarters or Anglin. And I just want to comment that a, a direct descendant of George C. Yount yeah. went to the grave with great bitterness that it's 
called Howell Mountain instead of Yount Mountain. And the entire family resented that because the Howells were caretakers and uh, yes, and employees. But anyway, Howell Mountain sounds great. Yeah. Thank you for what you did. It's just one of the great ones. We appreciate oh, it. Thank you. And it's, uh, I'm, I'm sorry now that it's not Yount, Yount Mountain, but I'm glad to write it down and remember it. If that's, <laughs> yeah, I feel like that's half the battle to be remembered. And I think that that section <clears throat> where Yant built his house mm -hmm. at the lower part of Howe Mountain, but it's in that area, mm -hmm. you know, the story that I know and the history that I know is that he traveled into that area um, and he fell in love with it. Um, and he said, this is where I'm going to live and I'm going to die. Oh, wow. And he just knew it. It was, it was his home to be. And so he actually built his home up in that, in that area, in the higher area, though he had his, he had a mill in the lower area in the Yauntville area. So, yeah. or, um, so it's, um, it's, it's really wonderful. Um, it's interesting. The history talks about yeah. Peter Vallejo said, you need to take two leagues because only need a half a league, you know, he goes, no, you have to take two leagues. So that's how it ended up being so much, um, so much uh, land. Oh, well, it was probably good advice, though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he was just trying to get the, he's trying to get the, you know, people settled there oh, yeah. um, back then. So anyways, so I, um, do you know about, is it Greg or Greg Mountain? G-R-I-E-G -E Mountain. Is there hmm. some history of that up there? I, I, and if not, I might be Greg, G-R-E-E-G. -E well, uh, the name sounds familiar, but it doesn't ring a strong bell. So I'll just keep an eye out for it. I feel like I may have seen it written down. We'll see what I find. Okay. Yeah. Interesting question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, it just, um, I've read something about that, some, you know, and I just thought, well, I would just kind of throw that out there. I might be confusing oh. another area. Do we have any other questions or should I um, ask Catherine some more questions? Am I still live by mic? You are live. Thank you. And did you Not did enough. you mention where where uh, Cade is to the west of the city of Angwin as Sentinel Hill? That's what it's called in Pacific Union College history. There may have been another name, but um, it's known as Sentinel Hill to the people who lived in Angwin during PUC times, so 1909 at least. Perfect. Perfect. No, it makes it makes good sense. And and the uh, the the Cade facility there is uh, it's phenomenal. It's well done. It's very complementary to the to the to the land. And it's a, it's an LED certified green building. And it, they just oh, did a beautiful. remarkable job to uh, yeah. to fit that in. It's really beautiful. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. And then, so, <clears throat> what inspired you about writing this book? And is this your first book? Have you written other books? This is my first book. Uh, yeah, so this was a lot of fun. Uh, you know, honestly, I think what inspired me was working with photographs. And um, there's, just, there's just something about that sort of the side-by-sides that I tried to end with. There's something about seeing the gas station that I go to to fill my car, you know, once a week seeing it in 1952 when it was fresh. And then seeing, in fact, what its predecessors looked like and imagining what my life would have been like at any of these moments. And particularly being struck by that story Elvira Angwin told, perhaps offhanded, to uh, the, the archeologist who was staying at her home. He completely misspelled their name, by the way, spelled it Angwan instead of Angwin. Uh, but his description of the valley is very clear. And he spelled Anguan, what else could it be? Um, but hearing this story about a, an indigenous man coming back to the place that he said, literally, you know, and this is like, I'm hearing it third, fourth hand. I don't even know how far separated I am, but this is where he grew up. And I know children who are growing up here today and feeling that incredible connection and I could feel that connection anywhere if I took the time to do the research. And just knowing that is so, so empowering and, and powerful. And I could feel that in your presentation. I and mean, as you shared that story, I was like, I got kind of choked up myself. Yeah. So yeah, it's very, very touching. Um, was that the biggest surprise that you had as you did, as you did your research? Was that story or was there others? 
But that's certainly one of the biggest surprises because when I started reading his uh, archaeological report, I did not know where on Howell Mountain he had been. But he begins to describe, he's like, I'm in this valley that's at the top of the mountain. And there's a creek that runs through it. And there are these acorn grinding stones set into lava rock in the ground. And I'm thinking to myself, there are there are acorn grinding sites just outside the library if I, if I just was to point my arm. And I begin to put it together and that sort of piecing it together was incredible. So that was certainly one of the biggest surprises and, and so much fun to learn because it's something that so little is written from the people who lived here. So finding that history is always a, an incredible experience. And then, you know, some of the other stuff I learned was simply like, I really love all the history of the land itself and uh, how people thought about the land for decades throughout the 20th century. All the folks who passed through Pacific Union College, they thought this, that Howell Mountain was an extinct volcano because of all the volcanic rock. And it took, uh, in the 1960s, there was a, a science professor who did some good work and he said, all right, stop calling this an extinct crater. It's not. But but obviously we are close to a volcano and that's why like we have this really deep history in the land itself of of this chaotic time so long ago that no one would remember it uh, but they used to call it um uh, they called this the college in the crater was what they called it because they thought it was a volcano that's interesting i didn't know that either um and so i know we're getting over time here i'm going to look and see if there's any other uh, question. So, so Liz, Lauren um, Coodley had a question oh, which good. she just sent in about, um, for Catherine about using the term WAPO. She is wondering about um, if the term should be re retired since it's not what people called themselves. I think that's a really good question. And uh, it's certainly something that I um, would like to do to the best of my ability as a historian and an author. So far, I, I only recently met someone who said that he has connections to uh, the tribal members who remain. I believe they live in Alexander Valley. I didn't have a connection before, so I didn't know what should I say. So to me, it seemed best to use a term that is widely used and uh, explain that that's why not because it is the appropriate term or that I would want to put it on to anyone else. Um, do the best that I could according to academia. But you know what, that's such a good question because just because uh, scholars have done something, that doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. So that is an area I would like to learn more. And you're absolutely right, uh, WAPO is, anytime you look up the history of that word, it's based off of according to what we know, a Spanish word, which of course is not going to be the history of the people themselves. So uh, if anyone here has learned more, I would love to know what you've learned and I'd love to, I'd love to do a better job. It's, you know, I've heard, um, and I don't know if this is even true, but that guapo, as you said, came from a Spanish word of guapo and mm. it got kind of like translated into guapo, but it was originally a guapo. And guapo, though I think it means handsome, it actually also means brave. And so it was a reference to brave people of that time. So that's that's what I've heard and like I've kind of I've read in reference to. Mm. I don't know if that's accurate. Um, I know that um, uh, Charlie Toledo she re references the guapos as onosati. Uh -huh. um, as a, a name, tribe name, which I haven't, I didn't read before. Um, Charlie Toledo presented that. Uh, there's another name, and I think Shelly, Dr. Smith, Dr. Shelly O. Smith. Um, <laughs> can Shelly, what was the other name for the Wapos? What was the original name that we thought the Wapo? Yeah. The, the, all of the words for the valley start with, with soft M's mm. and end with soft A's. So mm -hmm. Mirashal, Mayakama, um, those are the names. Napa actually means like the village, right? Yeah. Um, most people today know that it's not the name of the people, the Wapo, but really don't translate it in a modern terminology of handsome, but rather fierce um, because, they ha because Vallejo could not um, 
overrun the WAPO and neither could the POMO and neither could um, the Miwok. They were a pretty fierce tribe. They held the valley. And so that name is really, today we kind of get this terminology of, of handsome or something, but it's really should be fierce warriors. And so, because they, they uh, forced Vallejo to sign a treaty uh, mm -hmm. for the valley. And they then held a number of contracts with the Mexican government um, to manage the valley because they had been managing it for so long. So the Onasate, that term is a more modern term. I think using the term WAPO is the oldest term we have for yeah. the people. And so it's like Diegans or Gabrielanos. Or those are other terms that we have for a lot of the native tribes, first people tribes here in California. And they don't reflect the real name of the people or their, their language name, but they, they're, but they are the oldest names we have. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you. expanding on that too. I mean, we're, and this is what I love about history. Um, you know, Napa is very personal to me. Napa County, Napa Valley is very personal to me too. Um, but we're always, it's the discovery of history. It's such a treasure trove of, you know, of truth. It's just trying to be found, right? It's trying to be sought out and found and shared. So Last question, um, Catherine, what is next? Are you gonna write another book or what, what are you thinking next? You're so dynamic. Oh, thank you. Uh, so I would love to carry forward some of this like really regional history of Howell Mountain. If I have access to this history and it's rich, why not? So the next thing that I would like to try and we'll see what I can do, I'd love to write one of these books about Deer Park in particular and really focus on that community. And so um, I've talked a little bit to Arcadia Publishing about it. I need to do some research to see, well, what can I learn? Because I've been so immersed in Angwin, what can I learn about the Deer Park area and the that community surrounding the hospital? And I feel like it's so important to tell that story and particularly to capture the community in photographs because of how devastated everyone there was in the glass fires last year. So it feels very important to focus on that community and give them a collective memory if we can. So I've spoken to a few people who live there to see, okay, I know this is a hard question. Do you have photographs now? And some of them do, and we've started talking. So we'll see. I would love to do that. I would love I, that. I would love for you to do that too. That sounds like a really important um, history to share. So I, I hope you follow that. Okay. Well, we're we're definitely over time because this has been so fun and so interesting. 